All right, my name is Frank S. Keith, K-E-I-T-H. I started, and I'm a little vague on this, I think as an electronic technician in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in um, 1957 and ended up as being Vice President of International Marketing for RCA in uh, Princeton in 1985-86. Um, what were some of the first projects that you worked on? Uh, the first project would involve the, uh, the super power tube division of the uh, industrial tube and semiconductor division of RCA. And these, the super power tube division was formed to make the five megawatt power tubes for the Bemistic missile early warning system. Um, was that um, some other like major projects that you worked on? That's the, the, I was in that uh, division for, uh, from 1957. Well, I was, I started out as an electronic technician, then I graduated from college with a degree and was promoted to an engineer. I worked in engineering for two or three years, and then I was asked to, uh, to move to uh, Washington, D.C. to become the division liaison to the Department of Defense. Um, did you feel like RCA recognized your work? Oh yes, very much so. Um, how did larger companies, or how did changes in the company kind of change over time that you saw in your time there? Well, uh, I, was, I, was, I was very fortunate because I was able to progress throughout the company through a number of different divisions. And I thought that was primarily because the, the leadership at the top uh, of the corporation was looking to uh, move younger people up into uh, more more uh, serious positions, and I was a benefactor of that. And uh, going off of that, how do you feel? Do you have any like coworkers or supervisors who kind of stick out in your mind? Um, yeah, there were the early on. There was a, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Lloyd Garner, who basically ran the superpower tube division of the industrial tube and semiconductor division. He was a, a, a significant mentor. Unfortunately, he's long deceased. Uh, and then uh, later on, there was a fellow by the name of Joe Kern, who was a corporate vice president of marketing, and he was the one that eventually took me from a division to the corporate staff in New York City. And, uh, and the most significant uh, mentor I had, I guess, was a guy by the name of Ed Griffiths, who became CEO of RCA, and, and uh, he helped me along in the latter part of my career. So kind of overall, what was it like to work for RCA for so many years? I thought it was very interesting, very fascinating. In my case, I was transferred, I think, six or seven times. So I, I was very fortunate to have a very understanding wife. Her uh, attitude was, don't come home and tell me about the rumors. Come, to, come home and tell me where we're going and how much time I have to get ready. And I, th I think I pulled that on her six or seven times. What was it like having to transfer so many times? Were you still, did you always feel like you were welcomed within the company no matter where you were? Yes, very much so. And it was, it, eventually we had uh, three children and uh, because of the transfers, I think all three children have a, uh, a different perspective on life than they would have had if they'd been uh, located in one place all the time. Um, did you spend a lot of time with your coworkers outside of work? Like, do you remember any office parties or kind of uh, events that happened? Yes, I did when we were in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I had two tours of duty in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. That's where I started, moved to Washington, D.C., and came back to Lancaster. And that was a very, uh, what I'll call a cohesive group. Uh, everybody knew everybody. Everybody was supportive of everybody. And there were a lot of, I, I remember we had a, a great big, at our house, a great big, uh, outdoor lawn party, and it was typical of somebody to do that a couple times during the summer. Was there any other kind of RCA traditions that socially, maybe not within the company, but the coworkers and kind of the people you work with kind of had a tradition with? Well, I think we all stuck together. It didn't matter where you were. Uh, even when I was in an international position, uh, there were a number of uh, RCA people or ex-RCA people living in Switzerland where I was living and we managed to get together several times. So it was, there was a camaraderie that existed. Um, how do you think RCA affected South Jersey overall? Just because you've been in so many places, does South Jersey have like a specific kind of 
draw to it? Yeah, I'm, I'm not the right person to ask that question because of the six or seven positions I had. It was only at the very end that I was transferred to, uh, to Cherry Hill, but I was on the corporate staff at the time, so I was not involved in a, a South Jersey division. Uh, but I, even to this day, everybody, uh, you know, we've lived in South Jersey since 1980, uh, and even to this day, people have a very fond remembrance of RCA and all it did for the communities in South Jersey. We've heard that people call RCA family a lot. If I mean, if it's you being in so many different places, like you definitely felt that. Definitely, yep. Yeah. Still, still family. I still communicate with some of the friends that I made in different places all around the world. So how would you sum up your career at RCA? Was it kind of a job or did you get more from it as from, you know, just having a career there? Oh, I got more from it than RCA paid me. <laughs> no question about it. And, and, as, and as I said, so did my family. We were very fortunate to have a, an international assignment in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, and all three of my kids were with us when we were there. All three uh, speak at least two languages. In one case, he speaks four. And that's because of that assignment. And they all have passports, and they think nothing of, uh, if you say, let's go to Switzerland or let's go to Argentina tomorrow, they would say, let's go. <laughs> Do you have any particular incidents or stories that uh, you can relate from over your career working for RCA? Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, when I was uh, in, the, in the international part of the, uh, on the corporate staff, we had occasion on several occasions to have the uh, the CEO of RCA, Ed Griffiths, come to uh, visit us in Geneva, Switzerland. And one of the interesting things about Ed was whenever we would have a luncheon or a dinner, he had a, uh, I'm going to use the word fetish, but that's not the right word, but he had a, a fascination that you had to have a round table. It couldn't, he, that's the way he wanted to have lunch, at a round table, not at a square table. So one of my, when, it, when I knew he was coming to visit us in Geneva, Switzerland, and I knew there was a luncheon involved, I had to go out to the restaurant, make sure they had a round table, and make sure that the, the people at the restaurant knew that that was going to be our table for whatever day we were going to have lunch. And by the way, he also practiced that for a long time. Uh, Griffiths had a, uh, uh, he was a, lived in Gladwin, but he was on, he was CEO of RCA. So on typically on Mondays and Fridays, he would not go to New York City. He would have his office in building 206 in Cherry Hill. And he had a, a special luncheon, uh, uh, I'm called a cafeteria, set up there especially for him and the other people that worked for him. And it was all round tables. Oh, this is a good question. Um, you said being in the international division, do you think that RCA was one of America's most important companies? Uh, they were initially, uh, internationally, because we owned all the patents that had to do with black and white television and color television. And any company anywhere in the world that wanted to make, uh, wanted to get into the television business had to license that technology from RCA. So uh, this goes way back when it was when all the, uh, the the TVs and the radios were made with receiving tubes because RCA owned all that technology, and at that point in time, uh, we were I think we were one of the most important companies in the world. Also, uh, RCA initially was a communications company back in 1919, 1920, and uh, everybody respected the communications abilities of RCA Globecom and so forth. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, the other thing that was really funny, if you want to pick up on this, I, I mentioned Ed Griffiths uh, lived in Gladwin, and when he came to New York, well, he had two chauffeurs. Uh, one that drove him to New York in the morning, and, and he would pick Ed up at his house at like 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning. Get to, he'd get to New York before, try to get to New York before 8.30 when he'd have his first meeting scheduled. So that, that chauffeur was worn out by the time he got home. So he had a second chauffeur that picked him up in the evening. And I distinctly remember having meetings with Ed like at 4.30 in the afternoon. And his chauffeur would show up at 30 Rock at 4.45 so he could get through the Lincoln Tunnel before all the traffic. 
And if there was a meeting going on, it didn't matter what it was, uh, 4.45, he left, went downstairs and found another chauffeur. And the other thing is, he the, the, the morning chauffeur stopped at a, a newsstand, I've forgotten where, in Conshohocken maybe, and picked up the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times so that by the time Ed got to New York, he knew everything that was in the papers. And you couldn't, you, you, had, you had to know that because if you went up there and started to tell him something that was in the papers, he would have already have read all about it. Much. Yep. Frank, did you have any dealings with John Maestron? Uh, yes, I did. As a matter of fact, I was when you mentioned that the other day, he was in personnel. Mm -hmm. Now the, the the guy I dealt with in personnel most of the time because I was I was living uh, overseas was a guy by the name of Frank McCullough, who handed all the international money transfer and so forth for for personnel. Because when I lived in Switzerland, I was paid in U.S. dollars and also in Swiss francs. Uh, and, and there were people in RCA that handled that whole arrangement for me. Mm -hmm. right? And I think I mentioned to you, there is a, a, an RCA personnel guy, Bill Cooker, who uh, was in, was worked for Ed Scanlon at the very end and was involved in, uh, this is in 85, 86, when we were being sold to... Uh, to GE, he was the guy that uh, was involved with all the communications with the RCA employees so all of us wouldn't jump before the acquisition was taking place. And Bill lives in Mount Laurel, where I live. Yeah. One of the big concerns, in, in as you may know, Amy, in, in 85 and 86, RCA was sold to GE. And by that time, I had RCA branded on my chest, and uh, you know the underwear I wore had RCA on it, and so forth. And I had a chance to uh, go to GE up in Fairfield, uh, and I went up there, uh, looked around, and uh, and first of all, I would we would have had to pay, at that time. This was 1986. We would have had to pay a half million dollars for a house up in Fairfield, Connecticut. And I came back and I said to my wife, I'm not going to do it because I'll go up there, I'll be up there for a year, but I'll always be an RCA guy, won't be a GE guy, and they'll, invariably they'll find something wrong with me and I'll be out within a year. So we took our severance and, and ran. And that was the best decision I ever made. What was your opinion of the GE takeover? Uh, you really want to get me started on that? Yes. <laughs> uh, it was the only way uh, Thornton Bradshaw could satisfy the, the shareholders of RCA. Uh, as, as you may know, RCA was dominated by one person, David Sarnoff, from 1919 until 1969. And then, uh, and if you read any management books on that, uh, where a corporation is dominated for one guy for several generations, it usually takes one additional generation, 20 years, for the residue of that management style to wash through the corporation, and then you then you move on. Now that's not true today because today they move a little faster, but that's what it was true then. And uh, from 1969 until 1985-86, uh, RCA went through at least one, two, three, four. You have four CEOs, and I'll tell you one other story. Uh, and the guy that got me to New York was a, a guy by the name of Andy Conrad. He had hired this guy, Joe Kern, and they set up a program where they wanted people, high potential people coming out of the divisions to come to New York City, work on the corporate staff for three or four years, and then go into another division, not the one they came from, but the one, some other one. And I was designated to go to uh, the Consumer Electronics Division from Lancaster to New York to Indianapolis. But that never happened because Andrew, Andy Conrad, as you may know, was caught have, not having uh, paid his federal taxes and his New York state taxes. So overnight, he couldn't come into the state of New York anymore. And, and he was fired. And Ed Griffiths, who was that time was the uh, president of the RCA Service Company, became the CEO of RCA. And Ed, Ed and I were, became very good friends. But then uh, Ed made the big bet on Selectivision, uh, which was a, a play-only system and couldn't compete with the Sony Betamax. And then Ed got bounced out and they brought in Bob Frederick from GE. And uh, 
Thornton Bradshaw was chairman, and Bob showed up on a Monday, well, Bob was supposed to show, or did show up on a Monday morning, and Thornton Bradshaw, the chairman of the corporation, called me, because I was international, like the week before, and said, Bob is reported to be very interested in international, uh, would you make a presentation to this new CEO of RCA on Monday morning to, in, in a field that we think he's interested in? So I went up to the 53rd floor at 30 Rock and uh, met with Mr. Frederick and some other people and gave him an hour, an hour and a half presentation on, on RCA's uh, international business. And uh, I don't know whether I should be quoted on this or not, but um, I came downstairs to where my office was. And, and by the way, Frederick was supposed to be the guy that was going to save RCA. This was the last chance Thornton Bradshaw had to get somebody in there to really turn the corporation around. And I went downstairs to my buddies and said, hey guys, we're done. Uh, this guy doesn't have a vision, he doesn't have the charisma, he doesn't have what the corporation needs to get it past this 20-year cycle. And Bradshaw picked up on that in a couple months and put the company up for sale. And the, the company was sold for what I, I think sixty-five dollars a share, and the share the, the share price had been hanging around forty dollars a share for years and years and years, and and that that's how he got the shareholders satisfied. And GE bought us and broke us up into uh, a million pieces in no time. And GE kept the only thing GE kept uh, long term was NBC, and they made more money. GE paid, I think, $3.8 or $3.6 billion for RCA. In a matter of four or five years, they made all that money back just by keeping NBC.